Good morning, everyone. Uh, so for our next talk this morning, we are proud to introduce uh, David Lawrence and Ying Li, who are going to be discussing the tough, uh, their talk, and I'm going to try so hard not to mess up this idiom, when the going gets tough, get tough going. There we go. Give them a big round of applause. So yes, welcome to our talk. Uh, titled, When the Going Gets Tough, Get Tough Going. Um, I'm David. And I'm Ying. We work on the security team at Docker, and we'd like to share some of uh, our work that we feel that would be relevant to improving the security of distributing Python packages. So computers run software. They're basically complicated paperweights without it. But where does it actually come from? Um, we can't simply ship a computer with all the software that it needs and send it back to the manufacturer when we need new software or an upgrade. So we have to go and download this from somewhere on the internet, typically. Uh, and this means we have to trust somebody. Like, we're going to go and we're going to make a request to some entity and say, give me Python. And we're going to hope that they send us the right thing. Uh, and there are some guarantees that we can uh, break this trust down into. So imagine that you're a soldier. You follow your orders. And you only want to follow legitimate orders so that you get paid at the end of the month. Now, you wouldn't accept random orders from anyone on the street. Uh, this would be bad. Uh, they may be trying to trick you to feed you illegitimate orders. Um, so our first uh, guarantee is that the orders come from somebody within our chain of command, somebody that we should actually trust. Uh, and we call this guarantee authenticity, uh, the fact that our orders come from somebody in our chain of command. We don't necessarily care exactly who it is, just that they are somebody that we should trust. You also don't want to execute any orders that have been tampered with in root. No matter how trustworthy your messenger is, you want to make sure that you're executing orders that came directly from the source of the orders. You want some kind of assurance that the orders you received are accurate and complete from the time they were issued and to the time that they were actually delivered to you. Uh, we refer to this property as data integrity. You also don't want to execute any orders if they're out of date, because out of date orders may no longer be relevant and, in fact, uh, may actually be harmful. So, you want some kind of timestamp or some kind of expiration date after which the order should not be executed. Uh, we call this a freshness guarantee. So, you probably want your computer, just like the soldier, to execute relevant, accurate, and trustworthy orders. Um, for instance, when you uh, install a package or when you update a package from pip. So when you pip install a package, pip talks to PyPI over TLS. So you automatically get all the authenticity and integri integrity guarantees that TLS gives you. But you can get extra integrity insurance by pinning the hashes of your Python package dependencies in your requirements.txt. Unfortunately, this is kind of a manual process. You kind of have to download it, calculate the hashes yourself, then pin it, then add it to your requirements.txt. But there are tools like Hashin which can automate this process. Um, and for per performance, pip caches PyPI's HTTP responses. It respects the cache headers, which are set to five minutes. So when you pip install something, the package info is no older than five minutes old. But let's take our analogy of a soldier following orders a little further. So we definitely trust the messenger, PyPI, and the integrity that the data mess of the data that the messenger guarantees, because it's over TLS. But what are the origin of our orders? Uh, where, when, and how did the messenger get those orders? What we're asking is, how exactly did a package get onto PyPI in the first place? <laughs> well, someone on the internet signed up for an account on PyPI. They registered a Python package name. They uploaded one or more distributions to PyPI, but the permissions to upload or delete a distribution are granted per user account, which are gated by username, password, login. And especially since uploads are not guaranteed to be over TLS, those credentials could be compromised. So how do you know that the distribution you're trying to install hasn't been uploaded by some third party or tampered with? So how about package signing? PyPI lets you upload GPG signatures, um, and although it's t outside the typical PIP workflow, you can GPG verify the signature of the package you're downloading. Unfortunately, PyPI doesn't actually validate that the signatures are correct, so you might end up with a permanently broken package. It doesn't validate that the packages are signed consistently by the same person. 
so you'd have to do that check yourself. But even if PyPI did all of that and integrated GBG so it's not an outside tool, um, signatures are just a cryptographic primitive that guarantees authenticity and integrity over a series of bytes but without any extra context. Um, so to paraphrase Donald Stuff, who runs PyPI and helped a lot with this talk um, in his various blog posts and mailing lists, uh, even assuming that you can associate a key and signature with a particular person, all you know that is that that person, at some point, for some reason, signed that distribution. You don't know the reason, you don't know whether they should have been able to sign for it, and you don't actually know whether they intended for that signature and distribution to be uploaded to PyPI in the first place. So we can get some slightly better guarantees by cobbling together Hashin and uh, GPG and doing external ver verification, but it's kind of hard to use. Um, so is there any kind of better way we can do this? Is there some kind of more uh, systematic way to obtain better or at least comparable properties? And this is where TUF comes in, or the update framework. Uh, it's a specification that specifically describes a mechanism for distributing content in a secure way. Um, and for some history, it actually came out of the Tor project. Uh, Tor, back in, I think it was 2008, developed a tool called Thandy. Thandy was designed as a secure application updater for Tor. Uh, some researchers at New York University then took the principles of Thandy and expanded them out into a general purpose content distribution framework that they called TUF. Um, TUF uh, specifies a collection of signed metadata files. Um, and within those files, what you have is a key hierarchy and a Merkle tree. Um, and we're going to see how those two work together to allow you to verify all of the data in there. However, the TUF repository itself doesn't actually contain any of the packages you want to download. It gives you metadata about those packages, so checksums and the size. You can then go and use that metadata to download your package from anywhere. It could be a completely untrusted source over BitTorrent. But because you have these guarantees on what the package should look like, you can verify whatever you downloaded before you actually go and run it. And all that metadata falls into five basic tough categories, or roles, they call them, uh, root, timestamp, snapshot, targets, and delegations. Um, each role is associated with one or more signing keys. And we'll be representing the roles with these icons throughout the rest of the presentation, if you look for them. The most important role is the root role, which specifies which keys are valid signing keys for all the other roles, and also self-referentially specifies the valid signing keys for itself. And although I just show just one key here, actually, Tuff lets you specify multiple keys per role, as well as a threshold of signatures needed to make that piece of metadata valid. So kind of like how you need two people to like fire a nuclear missile, maybe. I don't actually know the number. Um, but for simplicity, for this talk, we're going to proceed as if every piece of meta metadata only has one key and needs only a single signature. So when a Tuff client downloads a Tuff repository for the first time, uh, the root file gets pinned like Chrome pins certificates that it sees for the first time. Um, so the root file and the root keys that can sign for it are actually the anchor of trust for the whole Tuff repository, which is why the owner of the root keys need to keep it really safe. Um, ideally, you'd have a backup that you'd put in a bank vault, and when you did need to actually use the root key to sign something, it would be on signing hardware like a YubiKey or a Nitro key, and only connected to a computer when needed. And from that, the target's metadata specifies the packages that we're actually interested in going and downloading. Um, and it's literally just a manifest of named things with metadata about them. Uh, but further, we mentioned delegations, and a targets file can specify other roles to which certain packages can be delegated. So in this example, we might have Alice as the maintainer of pip, and Bob as the maintainer of virtual env. And in our targets file, we create roles that say, this is Alice's key, and she is allowed to sign pip, and this is Bob's key, and he's allowed to sign virtual env. Alice and Bob then go and create their own targets files. And Alice signs in her versions of pip, Bob signs in his ver versions of virtual env, and they each sign those targets files with their own keys that we defined in our targets role. When you as a user are interested in going and downloading, for example, pip, you go to the targets file, you find that there isn't actually a pip package in there, but there is a delegation that says there's this person, Alice, that is allowed to sign pip, and it has a key that we should find that it's signed with. Um, 
Because you trust the targets key, because you trust the root key and you have your root pinned, you take Alice's public key and you go and download her targets file and you validate her targets file is signed with her public key. Well, she signed it with her private key. Um, from that, you can then trust the metadata about the available pip packages in there as having come from Alice. And using the hashes that you get from that metadata, you can go and download it and get your integrity guarantees. But this tree can then further be arbitrarily nested. So if Alice runs the pip project and she personally signs the source packages, but somebody else in her team signs the wheels, she can create her own delegations and further expand this delegation uh, key hierarchy. Um, so she can then publish the source packages, but she can allow somebody else in her project to actually publish the wheels. So Tuft grants much finer grain control over who can sign for which packages um, because it requires that a collaborator's key be explicitly blessed by a Tuft uh, repository administrator. It also provides extra context around why a package was signed. And because this would, if uh, PIP integrated Tuft, it wouldn't require any extra tooling like GPG to, GPG to check signatures, it provides better authenticity guarantees than PIP with the same ease of use. Also, because the collaborator actually provides the hashes along with the name, you don't have to generate it yourself. Um, we provide better integrity guarantees. So the good integrity guarantees that we get for packages are also provided for the metadata files themselves. Um, a snapshot metadata file gives you uh, a list of the uh, signed metadata in the Tuff repository, incl including, their, uh, including the, the signatures for the data. Um, and it hashes this so that this forms a Merkle tree uh, for the entire Tuff repository. The snapshot provides you a picture of what the current Tuff repository looks like. Um, if there's a change to any single file, like if you add a new collaborator, that file has to be re-signed, and that signed file has to be hashed and the snapshot updated. So you can't just change one piece without changing the whole thing. So this gives you integrity guarantees for almost every single metadata file. Um, and I said almost because which metadata file doesn't actually have integrity guarantees? Trick question. We haven't covered it yet. It's the timestamp file, which contains only the hashes for the signed snapshot. So if the snapshot gives you a picture of what the tough repository looks like, the timestamp file tells you what the latest picture is. Um, and to be valid, it has to be signed by the right role key. And you've probably noticed by now that like every single piece of metadata that we've shown has had an expiration date in a tiny, tiny font so far. So metadata is only valid if it's not expired. If metadata is expired, then the part of the tough repository reflected by that piece of metadata will become invalidated. For example, if the timestamp is invalid because it tells you what the latest tough picture is, the entire tough repository you have is invalid. But if only one of your delegations files ex is expired and none of your other files are expired, then only the packages listed under that delegation file um, will become invalid as part of the Tuff collection. But the rest of the Tuff repository will be usable. So this gives you really fine-grained freshness guarantees, even when operating in offline mode. Um, because if a particular subset of packages hasn't been resigned in a long time, maybe they should no longer com be considered valid. So the metadata, uh, different types of metadata have different lifetimes. A timestamp is really short-lived because you never want an outdated view of the Tuff repository. The snapshot is a little longer because it only needs to be updated when the Tuff repository changes, and that might not be as often. The targets and delegation metadata live even longer than that because a particular subset of packages may not change as often as all the packages and collaborators together. And your root metadata takes a really, really long time to expire because hopefully you've kept all your role keys safe, right? They haven't been compromised? Well, it's a really beautiful dream to keep all your keys safe, but it's impossible to keep everything perfectly safe. You just have to do the best you can and react quickly by discovering the keys compromised and rotating it out really quickly. Luckily, the tough spec writers take into account that you can't actually keep a key safe forever. So we said we anchor our trust on the root key. And underneath that, we frankly don't care what the other keys are as long as we can identify them when we need them. This means that if one of our keys gets compromised, for example, the snapshot key, we can just replace it in the root file, resign that root file with the root key that everybody is already anchoring their trust on, 
update any of the necessary roles, so in this case, the snapshot role, and republish that data, which will also necessitate signing a new timestamp. Uh, everybody who then goes to get any kind of update from the repository will detect that the root file has changed. They can then download that new root file, validate it with the pinned root key that they already know about, and then trust the new snapshot key. But what happens if the root key itself is compromised? Well, the first thing we do is we generate a new root key and we put it into our root file, just like we would if any other key was compromised. We then, though, sign that root file with both the old root key that everybody out in the wild has, pin wild has pinned and our new root key. When a user goes to update the repository, they detect the root file has changed and they go and download the new root file. They then validate that root file is signed with both the existing old root key that they already know about and the new root key. Um, this is, gives us what's known as key continuity. So you're not just trusting an arbitrary new key you downloaded, you have some basis for why you should trust this key. And having validated that the new file meets the requirements that it's signed with both the old key and the new key, they throw away the old root file that they had pinned and they accept the new one. Now one of the important aspects here is that as soon as you detect your root key has been compromised, you're in a race against the person who compromised it because they now need to access your actual servers where you're serving this root file from to rotate your root key from under you and publish a fake root key. However, as we mentioned earlier, Tough supports threshold signing. So you can make this really difficult for them and give yourself a massive advantage in winning this race by having multiple root keys and storing them in different bank vaults. And as soon as you know that one of them is compromised, you can go and get your quorum of two keys and rotate out the one that's been compromised and pretty much guarantee that you're going to win this foot race every single time. So by pinning root keys, providing threshold signing, and by um, allowing rotation of existing compromised keys in an easy-to-use manner, Tuff provides better authenticity guarantees, even if PyPI has been manned in the middle or compromised or you're operating against an insecure store. But the metadata structure we described and like the hashes pointing to other hashes is kind of confusing. So let's go over a really simple case where we're downloading a tough repository using a client that has already seen it before. Um, so we have a pinned root. Uh, but the first thing that the client will do is to ask PyPI for the latest timestamp. When it's downloaded, it validates the expiry and the signature against the pinned root. Then it uses the snapshot uh, hash in the timestamp. Um, and asks PyPI for the referenced snapshot. And this is important. PyPI has to provide all the tough metadata in a um, content addressable manner. So then we validate the snapshot, uh, expiry and signature, and use it to get the referenced root and target uh, metadata files. In this case, the root hasn't changed, so we can just use the root that we have on disk. Um, but we need to validate that both the root and targets haven't been expired. And again, we validate the signature for both. So once we have the targets file, we can walk down the delegation tree, as David described, and figure out exactly which delegation files are pertinent to the package that we want to install. We don't actually have to download all the delegation files, just the files that are pertinent to the package that we want to install. Um, we look up the hash in the snapshot, we download it, and then we validate the expiry and the signatures. And then we use the referenced package hash in that delegation file to go and download the package itself from a content address store or to validate something we have on disk that's insecure. So again, like these are the guarantees provided by PIP if you cobble together GPG and hash in and like pin hashing. It's not really that easy to use, um, but if you have a tough enabled PIP, the workflow is no different than regular PIP without extra tooling but it provides much better authenticity, integrity, and freshness guarantees. In addition, because everyone is downloading the same tough repository, we get the same auditability and monitoring uh, requirements, or sorry, properties as the certificate transparency project. Everyone will be able to see when a key changes or is rotated. So this seems pretty great, right? We should just integrate tough into pip and then mic drop, this talk is done. Well, not quite, but almost. Uh, Tough, as it says in its name, is a framework. And we have to think about how we're actually going to apply this framework to PyPI, because PyPI is a big collection of uh, repositories and collaborators. And one of the first things we have to think about is key management and role management and permissions. Like, 
who do we actually want to sign? Should PyPI just sign everything for everyone? Um, should they use delegations and give individual contributors their own keys to sign their own packages? Should there be some hybrid of that? Maybe there are even people who are, to this day, still hosting their packages somewhere off PyPI, and they want to maintain their own entire tough repository for their own signed content. And then we have to think about who is actually going to control the keys, like the root keys that everybody is going to anchor their trust on. Should this be PyPI? Should it be the Python Foundation? Um, or should it be some third party that we all agree we're going to trust? And there have already been two proposals on exactly how we might manage this. The first is PEP458, which is termed the minimal security model. Um, PyPI, PyPI is the root of all trust. It owns all the keys. And whenever anyone uploads a distribution, PyPI automatically signs it into the tough repository. But this is, again, gated on user login credentials. PEP480, which is slightly, uh, provides slightly better guarantees, allows maintainers to claim signing responsibility for their own packages, but only if they want to. PyPI will still automatically sign packages if you haven't claimed a key. So how can we start using tough? Well, uh, you may already be aware, but at Docker, we've been working on a project called Notary. And this is an opinionated implementation of the tough specification. I apologize it's written in Go. It's not written in Python. Um, but I understand there's like Python libraries to interface with Go now, so you should still use it. Um, and uh, yeah, let's see a little demo. We recorded the demo, just we didn't have to rely on network, because it took like half an hour to download all the dependencies. Um, so you. Uh, integrating Tough into PyPI will give you into, like, guarantees for your Python dependencies, but your deployment artifact is much more than just your dependencies. You might have art assets or what have you. For instance, here's a little toy example. Um, is it working? Where uh, we're just doing a uh, Flask app. It's the Hello World app, so all there is is a Python file and a template. So Let's see what we can do. First, we initialize a repository, a notary repository against a locally run server. This generates root keys and targets keys for you. Um, our server will automatically do snapshot and timestamp signing. So what can we check into this repository? Well, you don't actually have to count on PyPI to implement Tough. You can actually check in your own dependencies. It's kind of hacky. Um, much like hash pinning, you download the existing dependencies um, into a directory and you get their hashes and add them to the tough repository yourself. So here's a very like, short little bash command line uh, script to iterate all, over all packages and then add them to the repository, add the contents to the repository as a given file name. Um, and it's the same file name right now, but you could also add them under like a version number or like production or staging. Um, so now we, that we've added the packages, we publish them to our server. And then you can, we'll list them, and we can show that the packages have indeed be, been signed in, along with their hashes and their sizes. Um, so what can we do with this? Well, we, have, we provided a little shell script here that takes a bunch of arguments to the shell script and then verifies that the file represented by that argument is actually listed in the tough repository and that the hashes and sizes check out. So let's run this over um, our dependencies directory. But let's first add another dependency that hasn't been signed in and see what happens. So we just iterate over all the files in that directory. And it fails, because 6 has not been signed into the tough repo. So if we wanted to um, gate our dependency installation upon the script, we'd have to remove 6. Uh, you can just do like a verify ampersand ampersand before installing the packages from disk without actually having to check PyPI for an index because all the hashes have already been added to the tough repo. As you can see, all the dependencies have been installed um, and Flask should be runnable. But you don't actually have to sign in all your dependencies into the tough repo. You can, in fact, just sign um, the requirements file because, like, you can pin, uh, pip provides tools to pin hashes that way. So here's a really short ar um, command line argument to use hashin to generate uh, pin dependencies for your requirements.txt. It basically does the same thing. It downloads all the packages and hashes them your, uh, itself and adds them to the requirements.txt. So now your deployment artifacts are um, that Python file, the template, 
and your pin dependencies. You can check all of them into the tough repository. I didn't bother removing the dependencies because it would take too long. But you don't actually need the dependency files now. Sorry, typing is a bit slow. Cool. So now we publish um, these added files and we'll edit this template to instead of saying hello PyCon, say hello world. And now if we, if we verify all our deployment artifacts, we'll see that it's failed because the checksum for the template has failed. So if we go back and uh, undo our change and we want to gate running our Flask app on whether the dependencies, uh, on whether our deployment artifacts validate, then we can see if everything is exactly as we checked in, the Flask app runs, and we're good. So we should note, like, this is some interesting little scripts we've used to wrap Notary and PIP and sort of use them together. If you had Notary fully integrate, integrated into PIP, um, you wouldn't have to do any of this. You would just PIP install like you normally do. So super quickly, um, you can get Notary from our releases page, and we've actually spun up a Notary server. So if you guys DOS it, we're not going to keep it up. But if anybody wants to play with it, you can use the second URL there to actually, uh, it's the dash S flag to set the server for Notary. It will go down after the conference, so don't depend on it for anything. Yeah, but if you just want to play, it's there. There's like a land grab. As soon as you claim a name, it's yours. Um, other talks on packaging that you might be interested in going to that will help you do things like build binary artifacts um, that you could then use with Notary. Uh, we have an open space, 1 PM today, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 4. Um, if you have questions, because we don't have time for them, come along to the open space. Uh, learn more, read the spec. You can almost certainly read it on your flight on the way home. Um, look at Notary, doc content address for concrete implementation. And Python peps 458 and 480, read them. Thank you.